Well, good evening, folks. Uh, my name is Keith Burns, and uh, Dale Strickler is with me, and uh, Dale is going to be doing uh, another webinar in the Kansas Grazing Lands Association webinar series. So tonight's topic is making the most of native range, a very important topic, as probably most people that have cattle, I would say, Dale, probably have at least some native range, and uh, to be able to take advantage of it and utilize it uh, to the most efficient way is a very important part of keeping costs low and in, in maintaining your livestock herd. So I will uh, just let everybody know that we are recording this uh, for posterity's sake and for all the people who couldn't make it tonight, but I'm sure we'll be watching it down the road. So this is being recorded and uh, we will uh, get it over to Mary and crew and they'll get it up on the internet for people to watch later. So. Uh, Dale is going to talk for, well, I don't know, anytime we give Dale a time limit, he just kind of ignores it anyway. So Dale's going to talk until I tell him to stop, and then we'll try to leave some time for questions. So if you have questions, feel free to write them down, or you can type them in the chat window or in the Q&A box there on your webinar screen. Either one of those will work. Uh, I'll be monitoring those, and I will be giving those questions to Dale uh, at the end of the webinar here. So. Uh, looking forward to a great topic here, Dale. I'm going to go silent and hide and let you take it over. Okay. Uh, I have to do my disclaimer slides first, so I'll, I will pull those up real quickly. I can escape out of this. And I need to pull that up. Uh oh. I, and of course, I would not remember what I titled that under. Kind of a panicky situation. Um, uh, I guess I don't remember where I put that. Um, I'm quite embarrassed right now, but basically the gist of it is, is this is being brought to you by the Kansas Grazing Lands Coalition. I want to stress that the opinions and uh, are presented within this are, are mine and mine alone. Uh, so if I say anything controversial, um, it don't come back on KGLC, come back on me. So uh, we'll get cranking here and Dale, it's just hard, hard to imagine a situation where you'd say anything controversial though. <laughs> I, I can't imagine what that could possibly be. Um, Stick to grazing, you'll be fine. Okay. <laughs> e even even there, uh, there's some issues sometimes. So anyhow, like you said, a good chunk of the state of Kansas is covered with native rangeland. We probably have more acres of native range than just about any state in the union, especially if we're talking about old grass prairie. Um, uh, we are a, very much a prairie state, and uh, most of the remaining tall grass prairie that is remaining in the United States is is in Kansas. So it's it's a bit of a, a little known national treasure that we have here, particularly in the Flint Hills region of the state, where we still have pristine, unbroken, never plowed prairie. And uh, we're going to talk about a few things uh, about native prairie grass. How much of it to graze, when to graze, when not to graze, how to make more of it, how to make it more productive, and how to make more money from the grass you have. So let's just kind of set our expectations here. Uh, six acres per cow-calf pair uh, is, is typical in, in the eastern part of the state. Now, as you go farther and farther west, uh, that goes up to 12, in some cases, even 20 acres per cow-calf pair. Uh, and typically will turn in as soon as the grass turns green in May. It's continuously grazed by and large. When the grass is gone, completely consumed, the cattle are removed. That's usually 150 days. Most grazing leases are for 150 days, May through October or May through November. So, you know, five to six months of grazing during that time period. And if you look at typical Flint Hills, 
um, 150 day grazing period on six acres means 25 cow days per acre. And if that calf on that cow gains two pounds of gain per day, then that's a beef production of about 50 pounds. And that doesn't generate a lot of revenue. You know, if you're renting that grass for $30 an acre and you're getting 50 pounds off that acre, that's not a lot of margin to pay for all your other expenses. So um, makes things pretty tight, especially in today's economy. Now, how much to graze? Th this is classic. Uh, John Kreider did this study way back in the 50s, and it just demonstrates how much of this. Hey, Dale, are you, are you showing your slides? Because we're not seeing them. You're not seeing them at all? No. Nope. Um, yeah, I did start them. Let's share screen. That would that would help. There we go. There we got it. Okay. Okay, I wanted to show you that start at the first so you can see all this nice pretty prairie here. Um, and went through this math and this is what I wanted to show you. This is uh, the classic study done, John, done by John Kreider back in the 1950s. And basically uh, you do not, you can graze 10%, 20%, 30%, 40%, up to 50% of most grass plants will tolerate about 50% leaf removal without any harm to the grass root production stored food reserves. But once you exceed that threshold, you see it's 60%. Look at how precipitously that drops. And then just a little bit more, huge amount. And when you get up to 80, 90% defoliation, you really hammer the root production on that grass. So this is where the, the old uh, uh, advice of take half and leave half, and the half you leave will get bigger every year came from. And we're going to find out that there's maybe a little bit of revisiting these rules and seeing if there's uh, some modifications maybe we should make to them. So uh, what we'll start with this one though. You know, never take more than 50% of the leaf area during the growing season. And just to illustrate the uh, potential for this rule, and this is something we've seen, I, I showed this last week, I believe, basically just the difference in grazing down to a six inch canopy makes versus a three inch residual stubble height. You get a doubling in yield just by grazing less at each opportunity. And, and that is counterintuitive because typical cattlemen looks at grass as something that they need to eat in order to make money. And of course, that is how you make money. But once you start digging into, once you start opening that canopy up to the point where sunlight is striking bare soil, now you're wasting sunlight. You need a minimum amount of leaf area in order to maintain photosynthesis. If Photosynthesis is what drives everything. Capturing sunlight on green leaf area drives the whole pasture system. If you have sunlight not getting captured by green leaves, hitting bare soil, it's going to waste. So again, think of yourself as a used sunlight salesman. Now look at this situation. If you were driving along this pasture and looked from the road, it looked like there'd be all kinds of grass out there. Boy, that guy's a really good pasture manager. What do you see when you look at this though? What, what, what comes to your mind? What percent defoliation was this plant? Or this one? Or this one? It was not touched at all. Did this contribute, this plant contribute to your beef yield or this one? or this one, not at all. 
Now, what defoliation, what percent defoliation were these plants right here? See, those were almost 100%. So why does this happen? Well, in the early part of the season, when the grass is growing very rapidly, this plant got eaten. This one did not. Three weeks later, this plant is getting big and coarse. This plant has tender young regrowth. So the cows will continue to eat these plants with tender young regrowth. How efficient is this situation here? We've got plants defoliated at 90% and some at 0%. Remember our target's about 40%. This is very, very inefficient. Half these plants did not contribute. Half the other half that did contribute won't be very productive next year. This is why our pastures decline in productivity. This is why we, we do not get optimum yields off of continuous graze pasture. How do you solve this situation? You solve it through rotational grazing. And with the tools that we have now, like these, these uh, nice little portable poly reels, we got this poly wire, step in fence post. Um, you can put up fences and rotational graze incredibly easy. This is really a, everybody says, oh, I don't have time to do this. Um, if I were to ask, and the analogy I use repeatedly, I know I will repeat myself on this all the time, but we probably have some people who haven't watched previously. If your neighbor across the road, let's say you have a thousand acres, your neighbor right across the road from you stops by and says, hey, would you like to rent my ground? Would you say yes? I'd say most farmers probably would. And, but let's just assume that he keeps going. He says, before you turn, turn me down, I'll tell you, the rent is free. And then he says, oh, wait, before you turn me down, um, I will pay for all the inputs. So free rent, no additional land cost, no additional input cost. All you have to do is work harder. Would you take that deal? Before you say yes, I'm telling you, no, you just told me you're too busy. You don't have 10 minutes in your day to double your productivity without any additional land costs and without any additional input costs. You just told me you're too busy. You say, but I could double my productivity without writing more checks. That's exactly what this rotational grazing does, people. It doubles your productivity with a very small investment of time. And I know everybody feels they're pinched for time, but I have seen research where they actually measured, where they took a ranch, part of the pastures were continuously grazed, part of them were rotationally grazed with daily movement using portable fencing. You know what they found? The time commitment per cow dropped 75%. 75% less time commitment because they were incredibly easy to catch. They're incredibly easy to count. They, all the big rodeos went away because you already had the cattle somewhat confined when you needed to catch them, when you need to treat them. They were able to observe the cattle more closely. The cattle became tame. All of the things that cost us so much time in the cattle business go away when you graze in this manner. And I, I think I may have shown this before as well. Um, the pasture on the right is actually carrying twice as many cattle as pasture on the left per acre. And cattle consume, when you can find them, they consume just about everything. You can see right where that fence was just taken up, cattle amount moved over there. And of course, one of the best benefits of this rotational grazing that animals eat weeds. Their behavior really changes. You see, they basically ate everything here. Uh, this is a, a pasture in South Africa, just to show the power, this rotational grazing. Um, you can see the, the little bare areas in here. You can see the patchy grazing. 
The bare areas here are the palatable grasses, the desirable ones. Ones kind of like uh, be similar to our big blue stem. These clumps here that are not eaten are a grass called Aragrostis, which would be like uh, the weeping love grass that you sometimes see in Oklahoma. And it's this pasture, not super productive. This is how the neighbor, who's one of my host families, is grazing his animals. This guy right here moves this fence every two hours, six times a day movement. All he does is take this fence up and set it on up on down the line. The calves are allowed to crawl under it. The sheep are allowed to crawl under it. And these cows are sitting here and they clean up. They can go in there and sneak a few goodies. Cows clean everything up. When they are done, there are no thistles left standing. There's no brush left standing. They obliterate everything. He is grazing five times the number of cows per acre as the pasture in the previous photo is carrying. Five times the stocking rate. I'm not guaranteeing you can do that now, but what he does is he gives it a very long rest. This is what the pasture looks like after three years of this treatment. Because he's managing the rest period, managing the intensity and managing the rest period. And rotational grazing is is something that if you use it, it's only as good as the person managing it. If you understand the principles as why it works and understand what you're trying to accomplish, then it can be an extremely powerful tool. If you don't know what you're doing, uh, it, it can be a very destructive tool. It's very, very important that you understand what you're doing and how to manage grass growth. But when you do, wow, the results are just spectacular. This grass was so thick, it wore you, you walk 100 feet in it, you're wore out. To understand the grass life cycle, there's three stages, vegetative, reproductive, and dormant. The vegetative stage is the highest forage quality. And because the, the growing points on the leaves are very low to the ground, it will regrow and it'll tolerate defoliation very well, as long as you don't take too much leaf area at any one time. Now, the reproductive stage is when the seed heads start to pop out. The forage quality will drop really rapidly because it is kicking into reproductive gear. It's trying to um, hold up a seed head. It doesn't produce any new leaves and the growing points come up above ground. And so, this is uh, much lower quality and it can be harmed by intense grazing at this time, close grazing at that time. Now during the dormant period and, and on warm season grasses, this would be the winter and all the carbohydrates, the non-structural protein has moved underground into the roots. The quality is poor, but you cannot harm grasses by grazing during the dormant period. You can even burn them off in the dormant period, and we'll talk about fire later. But the neat thing about dormant season grazing is you can literally take 100% of that above ground growth and not harm the grass. Um, now, you may harm the soil by leaving it exposed, but you won't harm the grass itself. So the, the vegetative period on our warm season grasses in Kansas is from early May to the middle of July. Reproductive periods from middle of July to essentially first frost, uh, October 1st, roughly. And the dormant period, basically from frost to spring green. -up. Now, how does grazing at, now this was a clipping study, not actually grazing, but look at how early season grazing left more carbohydrate in the roots than late season grazing. Late season grazing is the most, one of the most destructive things you can do to native grass. Here's something else that's interesting. Notice how this unmowed grass actually had less carbohydrate than grass grazed early. Grass 
warm season grasses are very intolerant of shade and their residue does not break down readily. It has, it's extremely low in protein. It doesn't rot very readily. And so that old residue will actually choke out new growth. It's very important on warm season grasses. This is what a lot of anti-grazing advocates, people who are against the raising of beef cattle on pastures and rangelands, they assume that grasslands are healthy if they're not grazed. And that's completely untrue. Grasslands need to be grazed. These plants need defoliated. They especially need that old dead growth removed. You can mow it, you can graze it, or you can burn it. But don't leave it there. That will actually kill the grass. And I've got pictures of where grass has actually been killed. And when you look at native grass, um, it becomes important, and this is something you learn very quickly when you're rotational grazing, you learn when your grass is actually produced. And May and June is really when about 70%, about 70% is produced from May 15th to July 15th. Only about 30% is produced from July 15th to October 1st. And once you understand that, that little piece of information can give you a lot of power because that's when it's most productive, that's when it's most nutritious, and during the growing season, that's when it's most resistant to grazing. Now, if you look at the requirements of a cow-calf unit, uh, when they calve, of course, the cow needs jump up quite a little bit because she's making milk. And as the calf begins to eat grass, its needs go up. Now the cow needs actually go down because it's not milking as much, but the calf needs are growing and growing. So the combination of the two increases and that lasts until weaning. And then the, the needs drop quite a little bit. And if you contrast that to the monthly production of blue stem range, you see that the, the grass production is front loaded and the demand is back loaded. This is why, uh, you know, when, when we stock season long, continuous graze, season long, leave them out there. This is why our pastures tend to get really beat up. Like that patchy graze pasture I showed you, that's why those pastures tend to get really beat up in late season. Our pastures tend to be understocked and overgrazed. And the only way you can keep a pasture healthy with continuous grazing is to have a very low stocking rate. So um, one different way of doing it, and, and this is a concept uh, uh, my major professor, Clinton Owensby, uh, pioneered this thing called intensive early stocking. And basically you double the traditional stocking rate, but you only graze for the first half of the season. Now, for example, on a, on a steer in the Flint Hills, you would typically give a steer three to four acres to a pair, or, or to a steer. Three to four acres for a steer for the full five months. But if you only graze for two and a half months, you can run a steer on one and a half to two acres twice as many animals to the pasture. And because you're grazing when the grass is really good, this really increases your beef gain per acre. And it works great if you're running stalker steers. Now, if you're running cow-calf operation, uh, cows eat, wanna eat more than two and a half months out of the year. It means you have to find another source of feed for the rest of the nine and a half months out of the year. So. Uh, One problem, that's why a lot of the Flint Hills has gone to a seasonal stalker operation. I mean, this has been, this intensive early stalking has been wildly successful. It works extremely well at putting gain on animals. They will gain on that intensive early stock pasture almost as well as what they will in the feedlot at much less cost. But what are problems with this intensive early stocking concept? Um, it works, I mean, it, it's, it's been wildly successful, but there are a couple of unanticipated consequences to it. And one is, if you look at this, um, 
look at when people are buying those calves to put out on grass. They're buying at the high of the cycle and selling after those calves crash, after the price crashes. So they're buying up here, selling down here. And um, one of the first things they teach you in any business college is secret to success is to buy low and sell high. Unfortunately, with the intensive early stocking, you're buying high and selling low. And uh, not a good recipe for financial success. And the other problem is, is that when you have big regions that rely on when all the income in the area is generated in just two and a half months and all the economic activity ceases the rest of the year, you get this, you get empty streets in small town America. I mean, if all the cattle are gone by July 15th, what does the veterinarian do the rest of the year? What does the feed dealer do the rest of the year? I mean, yeah, you can make a little money on pet food, but um, it doesn't, you really need a year round type of activity. And we'll talk about some, some twist to a intensive early stocking that can make it a much more viable system. I think uh, take advantage of the, the biological superior of that and help it make it even more economical. Um, now, this is a, uh, discovered some some research they did in Tennessee and one neat thing about Tennessee is that those folks there know absolutely nothing about native grass and readily admit it and because they knew nothing about native grass they um, they had no pre-existing assumptions about how to manage it so they actually tried all different kinds of things um, turn in heights, take out heights, you know, rotational grazing and so forth. And what they settled on, and this seems crazy to us, turning in at 24 inches in height on a paddock and taking out at 15 inches in height. Now, if you're one of those people who sees, if you see green left in a paddock at the end of the grazing period, that's wasted grass. This would drive you nuts. And they compared a 100 day grazing season to a 71 day grazing season. So this is basically your intensive early stock type concept, except they moved it just a little bit later. Now, for the people who are used to, to turning in as soon as the pasture turns green and take it out when it turns brown in the fall, this is, this is gonna be a real shock to your system. But let's take a look at it. Remember, we stir, first started talking, out, talking about um, the expectations for native grass. We're expecting 50 pounds of beef an acre. So take a look at some of these figures here. I thought this was just fascinating. Animal unit days per acre. Remember, we were talking earlier about 25. This is what they were getting on that kind of grazing system. Remember, these people didn't know a thing about it. They just trial and error found out what worked. 170 animal unit days per acre. That's about, what, six, seven times what we're doing? And um, look at the average daily gains. Still very respectable. And they were turning in when we would consider the grass to be way too fibrous, but they weren't forcing the animals to eat it all. They were allowing the animals to just strip the leaves off, take off the tops and leave all the stems instead of forcing them to consume everything. And look at this beef per acre. Remember, we were only expecting 50 pounds an acre and they're doing eight, nine times that in some cases. This is impressive folks. Um, now, can we do that here? I don't know. I've never grazed in that manner. I just ran across this research this winter and I thought, wow, that's, that's a real paradigm. Um, that's like a cannonball smashing into my paradigms here on what's possible on native grass. Uh, can we get that here? I have no idea, but um, I think it's maybe a concept we ought to seriously explore. 
because these are pie in the sky numbers, a little hard to swallow. But uh, I mean, they, I don't think they're lying. This is what they actually got. So um, now one way of getting around that native grass uh, late season slump is, um, is to move. One thing, if you're going to intensive early stock, you know, like in the Tennessee study was 71 days, the uh, uh, full intensive early stock. If we wanted to adapt that concept to cow-calf units, not just stalker steers, but cow-calf units, that necessitates having some late summer forage. And this is where some of your cover crops come in. This is, uh, you know, stuff that was planted in, uh, planted in the summer on crop ground, and this is in August, and you can see there's all different kinds of plants out here. We got one, you know, happy cows don't just live in California. Uh, this cow, pretty happy too. Another way of making grass grow, we've talked about nitrogen fertilizer, and especially nitrogen fertilizer on cool season grasses. Now, on native rangeland, there's an assumption that native rangeland does not respond to nitrogen. It actually does. Um, but when you apply nitrogen, it tends to start to shift the species composition to more weeds and more undesirable cool season grasses like cheatgrass. So if you are going to fertilize native range, look at this data here. This is from the University of Nebraska. Look at these numbers here. Nothing fire only, and that fire, by removing that old residue, allowed the new growth to come up and get full sunlight, 80 pounds of nitrogen without burning, but look when you combine nitrogen and fire together. Holy smokes, no pun intended there, but look at what happens to your productivity when you combine nitrogen and fire. And, um, the applying fertilizer to native rangeland a lot of times is even though it gives us production increases a lot of times it's just not economical the increase doesn't necessarily pay for the fertilizer but another way of getting nitrogen into that rangeland system is with legumes now not all legumes are compatible with native rangeland and um, if you have true, unbroken, pristine, never been sprayed native rangeland, I would be very, very hesitant about introducing exotic species into that system. It, it, I think we have, especially in the Flint Hills of Kansas, a bit of a national treasure there. Um, and I hate to see exotic plants introduced that, that could take over. If, however, you have a more typical pasture, that is monoculture grass because it's been sprayed with Tordon for years and years. You have no existing legume component. You have no forb component out there. You can, I, I see nothing wrong with putting some legumes out there. The yellow blossom sweet clover is a very successful one. Um, and one advantage of the yellow blossom sweet clover is not only does it grow during the early part of summer, but here it is in November. And look at all that biomass out there in November. And that can provide protein, as we'll talk later, that can act as a supplement to this low protein dormant native grass. Now, if you want to intercede some legumes into your system, some of these are, are not just legumes, but other plants. We'll talk about some other ones here. Uh, things you can put in, in the fall, like right now, spring peas will grow in the fall and then winter kill. So there's no real problem with this becoming a weed. Winter cereals, I'll show you some pictures of that. Um, sweet clover can be done in the spring. I probably should have put winter on this. You can broadcast sweet clover in the winter time, establishes very well. Um, if you do sweet clover, it is important that you graze this hard in the spring. Sweet clover works very well in conjunction with an intensive early stock grazing system. You do want to put some grazing pressure on that sweet clover. Otherwise, it, it can 
be pretty aggressive takeover. Another one is alfalfa at one pound per acre. That's all it takes, folks. One pound of alfalfa per acre is plenty in a native rangeland situation. So that's really very cheap. You know, when you get alfalfa for two fifty four dollars a pound, some of the cheaper varieties. This is this is a real. You combine one pound of alfalfa per acre with some rotational grazing, you can get a huge increase in in uh, in pasture performance. We talked a little bit about fire. There's some real advantages to fire in a system. Um, and a lot of these advantages are really kind of counterintuitive. First, improves animal performance. That was the original reason. Indians burned native grasslands to attract bison uh, for easier hunting. And of course, once a, a few of the Native Americans figured this out, uh, the rest of them caught on. And if you didn't burn your patch of grass in your area and someone else did, um, you were probably going to go without because the bison would go to their place instead of yours. So the use of fire among indigenous Americans spread very rapidly uh, because animals like that newly burned grass um, and they perform better on it. Improves the grazing distribution. The, the places that did not get grazed last year have more fuel loads, so burn better than the places that were overgrazed. So it's uh, kind of a levels the playing field between plants. Uh, the, instead of having all that old growth sitting there, starts everything off with a clean slate. It gets rid of cedar trees, gets rid of a lot of other weedy species, um, and it does shift the fire tolerant species tend to be the more drought tolerant species. So fire does a lot of really good things out in that prairie. Now, of course, there are drawbacks to fire. One, of course, is the, the safety aspect of it. Fire, um, very useful tool, but there's some risk involved. You know, risk to property, risk to life and limb. Um, and uh, ecologically, um, of course, the smoke can be a risk as well. But um, when you burn that carbon, you are losing carbon out of the system. And I have on here, but maybe not soil organic matter. Uh, when I was at, at Kansas State in grad school, I uh, participated in some really long-term research, took measurements, and our burned pastures actually had higher levels of soil organic matter than the unburned plots. And you say, how can that be? How can you burn all that residue and be higher in carbon. Well, the main contributor to soil organic matter is not the decay of above ground residue, especially that, that grass residue is so low in protein, it just does not nourish soil microbes. It, it contributes very, very little to soil organic matter. It, it just, the biggest contributor is root exudates. And when you clean off that old residue and allow all those new shoots to get full sunlight, your level of root exudates skyrockets. And you actually get more soil organic matter from burning pastures than from not burning pastures. And, and until you understand the dynamics of how soil organic matter is built through root exudates, uh, that's not what you would assume. But still, that is carbon that was on the soil that's going up in the air. Is there an alternative fire that accomplished some of the same things? And yes, I would say winter grazing that grass can accomplish many of the same things. The, the goal is to remove that residue. Now winter grazing, dormant season grazing, will not accomplish everything fire will do. But it can accomplish some of the things that fire can do. So it might be a situation where the wise thing is to rotate burning with winter grazing. Maybe you burn one year and two, one year and three, and you winter graze the other two. And maybe you have some pastures where you leave a little bit, um, ungrazed, unburned for nesting habitat or whatever your land management goals are. Uh, you know, accumulate enough fuel to get rid of some cedar trees. Now, I'm going to ask you a question here. 
green grass, green growing season grass, let's say vegetative grass, 12% protein, 65% digestible. In the winter time, that dormant grass is a fraction of that. Too low in protein to really sustain that. Out. Which of these is worth more, the green grass or the dormant grass? Most people say, that's obvious. I mean, look at it. It's higher protein, it's more digestible. So if our measure of value is the level of protein and the level of digestibility, why, if we allow that to get to the beginning of the vegetative stage and bail it up to where it's 6% protein and 55% digestible, it's worth more in a bale than it is out in the field. Why is that? The pasture, the green pasture is more nutritious than what's in the bale. So how can we pay more for the bale than we do for the pasture that produces it? Well, one is there's obviously more cost involved in making the bale. The other thing is, is that when do we feed the bale? We feed the bale in the winter. And so if that bale is more valuable because we feed it in the winter, doesn't that make the dormant forage more valuable as well if you graze it in the winter. Remember I said, and when we started out, you know, number one, we will take half and leave half. Why do people not do that? We all know that. That's the way you manage grass. You take half, you leave half, the half you leave gets bigger every year. So why don't we do that? It's because we see the half we leave as wasted grass. And that's not what the economics show. The lighter you graze, actually the more economic, the more money you make. But it's hard for a cattleman until they make that switch in their mind to consider themselves as a harvester of sunlight instead of a beef producer. Once you make that switch to, I am a harvester of sunlight, you will tend to overgraze. And overgrazing is almost universal because people don't see that. They don't make that connection in their mind. But if you see that half you leave as being more valuable than the half you graze during the growing season, because you can graze it in the winter with dry cows, then all of a sudden you have a tremendous economic opportunity. So how do you use dormant native grass effectively? I think the first thing is, is that to use dormant native grass, your cows should be non-lactating. Dormant native grass has enough energy to supply the needs of a dry cow. It does not have enough energy to meet the needs of a lactating cow. Simply just not digestible enough. You want to make sure that your cows, if you really want to make good use of dormant native grass, have your dry period coincide when you are grazing native grass. Native grass also does not contain enough protein. That 3% average is just not enough to feed the microbes in the rumen. Microbes in the rumen need about 7% protein. And there's only, usually less than half that. I've seen analysis where I am here in Southeast Kansas, around 1% protein on some dormant native grass, basically have to supplement all of the protein needs of the animal. That amounts to about a pound of protein per day. But it's actually more effective. It's, it's difficult logistically to give a cow a small amount of supplement daily to make sure she gets her pound of protein. It's actually easiest and the form of the supplement is, is also important. You do not want starch. Starch, starchy products acidify the rumen and make forage less digestible. And starch supplements are usually low in protein. You have to feed a lot of it, get the protein you need, and if you feed enough, 
you would actually get a decrease in fiber digestibility. Now, the frequency of feeding about every third day is the best. Um, the the pro excess protein will cycle around in the bloodstream, come back into the rumen as urea, and so you get a slow trickle of urea if you feed a large amount of protein, enough protein for three pounds a day, but only every third day, animals actually perform better. Now, another way of, and, and a lot of that is because when you feed a limited amount of supplement, the cows will fight a lot and, and won't necessarily, uh, the skinny cows, the ones that need it most, won't get their share. Now to get around that, you feed a large amount every third day. A little easier for the weaker cows to get their share. Another way of making sure that all the cows get their share is to use a self feeder with some sort of intake limiter. Uh, salt works as an intake limiter. Uh, fish oil is very expensive, but it's also very, very, very effective. And uh, urea, because of its bitter taste, has been used. Um, in Africa and Australia, urea is a very, very common range supplement. Uh, research shows that it is distinctly inferior to natural protein, but it is so cheap that it, it still has a use because of it, it's just how cheap it is. Um, I know people that use biuret, which is basically two urea molecules linked together. That's a slow release. Biuret is used much more efficiently than what urea is. Another thing that really helps animals digest uh, dormant forage is Aspergillus oryza, which is a, a fungus. Um, they culture the fungus on basically on crop residue and then extract the enzyme fungi are able to break down uh, really fibrous high lignin crop residue. Um, Aspergillus oryza, they culture it up, extract the enzyme out, um, Amiferm, trade name for that. Uh, it used to be there was one company, uh, Vitafirm, that had a monopoly on that product. Now the patent is off and, and almost every feed manufacturer can use it. it. It really does work wonders. It's amazing how, how effective it really is. Ionophores like Remensen or Bovitec help. And if you need protein, um, what about growing protein right in the pasture instead of buying it? Uh, like for example, this is from Eastern Colorado, Southeast Colorado, about 10, 12 inch rainfall area. This is rye that was drilled into native grass. And this is actually third year volunteer rye. Graze it in early spring, get off, let the rye get up and shoot a seed head. No cow will eat it in this stage. So they come in here and that ripens and they just manage this rye to reseed. And so they're getting double use out of their pasture by seeding that cool season grass in there. Now, how do you make more money from the grass? We've talked about um, producing more grass. We learned a little bit about the grass. Now let's talk about how do you make more money in your grass? Well, what if you could, you've got dormant native grass. Can you custom winter cows for people? People that don't want to mess around. They like having cattle on pastures in the summer because it's easy in the summer, especially if you continuously graze, you just turn them out there and forget them a lot of times. Here's when the work comes in. What if you could winter cows for people that on your dormant native with protein supplement, you can market your dormant grass through someone else's cow. Um, look at your, your cycle and how does your, um, how does your cow herd fit and how do, with your forage supply? And ask yourself, I was taught that fall calving does not belong on native grass. After looking at some people and examining their operations, I think maybe we ought to uh, revisit that. And I'll, I'll show you some of this. Again, this is this is the cow year. You know, this is this is not the months of the year. This is basically calving it here and and breeding it here and weaning here. And and this can be shifted, you know, left, right, whichever to fit the months of the year, depending on when you want to calve, when you want to wean. So 
if you are the typical person in Kansas who calves in February, right up in here, um, you have a big gaping hole in your forage supply right here, right where this red arrow is. How do you supply, and remember, right after calving, this may be when you need the most feed, but here is when you need the most quality feed. And if you are calving in the winter, February is not spring, folks. You're calving in February, that's winter calving. You have a big gaping hole right here. And you also have another hole here. But how, this one is the critical one because getting those cows rebred is job number one. So if you are winter calving, this is where you really need help in your forage supply. How do you supply it? Well, one way is with cool season grasses like this stockpiled fescue. We, last week we talked about brome and fescue and how best to utilize them. And using cool season grasses in conjunction with warm season grasses can form a very, um, a much stronger syst forage system than just one of them alone. Now, if you know, what I've done here, you notice this is slightly different. The, the, the graph before we were calving over here in February. Now I've moved calving to April, May. Now this is closer to this curve. In fact, it matches the cow needs quite well. But you've still got this late summer period. What do you do about that? Well, oh, I sorry, I, I meant to have a picture of that uh, sedan grass pasture that I showed earlier in this point. This is where you can fill in with a you know late season cover crop. Um, sedan grass, millets, uh, grazing corn, cow peas, sun hemp, et cetera. And that can all be spliced in here. Now, talked about fall calving how I was taught that, you know, warm season grasses grow in the summer, fall calving, you, you, you need good quality forage in the winter. Well, if you look at this hump right here, your totus, total volume needs are actually highest right before weaning. If you're weaning in the fall, then your need, highest volume needs are in the fall, and that's not when we get the most sunlight. We get the most sunlight around the summer solstice, which is June 21st. What if we had our highest needs coincide when, with our highest production throughout the year? Doesn't this make sense? Now, doing that though, if your only forage is native grass, this doesn't make much sense because you've got a big hole here you need a lot of quality right here, and you need a lot of quality in the winter time. And you don't get that from native grass. So this is where, again, if you have fescue in conjunction with native grass, and I think this is a system that has a huge amount of merit in the Flint Hills because they, um, we have pockets of very good soil, very conducive to growing fescue, that really aren't big enough to justify owning equipment to raise crops. People still want to lose money raising corn and beans uh, when they're really cowboys. And put those river bottoms in the Flint Hills to fescue and you can put them to good use. One way is with a fall calving herd. Now, another thing we talked about on, on the, and I'm just about to wrap up here. I know I'm running short on time. Um, Remember that one of the big problems I pointed out with the intensive early stocking system economically, remember it works fantastic biologically, perfect fit for utilizing native grass. But economically, you know, everybody has grass fever this time of year and, and everybody is competing for those grass calves. But look here, this is, you know, if you want to buy low and sell high, Look at this. This is when you want to buy calves. And if you have cheap means of feeding those calves, 
in the fall and winter, then you can make use of this. So here's a suggested grazing plan for stalker calves in the Flint Hills. Um, in September, you, you have, we use the intensive early stock concept. So in September, you've got some regrowth there, drill rye or another winter cereal into that intensive early stock native range. Now, obviously not every acre of native range because this stuff wasn't plowed because it's rocky. So you probably can't do this on every acre, but you don't need to, do it where you can. Buy calves in October and November at the low of the market, place on that dormant native range with rye in, drilled into it, and you strip graze it off. If you let them have the whole thing, they'll trample it all, eating every little last bit of rye and it'll be gone in two weeks. So you strip graze it to force them to consume some, uh, make them eat the brown, uh, the, the dark part of the Oreo along with that white creamy stuff in the middle. Make them eat the whole Oreo cookie. Don't let them just eat the, the white stuff out and put the, the cookies in the box like my brothers used to. Um, after the rye and the native plays out in the fall, move to stockpiled fescue. This is where you plan on your winter bottoms to replace the corn and beans that are losing money year after year. Uh, sell your equipment and, and plant it to fescue. And then March, that rye greens up again. In April, the fescue greens up. And then you intensive early stock that native range. If you buy lightweight calves in the fall and run them through till spring, they're eight, 900 pounds ready for the feedlot. You put four or 500 pounds on those animals for very little money. You bought low and you sold. So um, this is just reiterating that, buy calves here, have rye growing in your native grass here, stockpiled fescue, back to rye, back to fescue, intensive release back to your native grass. You just basically rotate back and forth between these two things. So it's helpful if they're adjacent and then you sell in July or put in a feedlot. And that is all done for very little money. And same, basically the same concept that you could use for a fall calving herd. So anyhow, uh, I'll wrap up here. And uh, there's my, my contact information. I, I, I failed to mention that I do have a, a couple books on this. If you're interested, uh, give me an email or uh, give me a call. I'd love to talk to you. Keith, what did I forget to mention? I don't know. I think you covered things pretty well there. Uh, does anybody have any questions? If you do, put them in the chat box. I sent out a request for questions. We are pretty well up against our time here. But uh, if you have any questions, just let me know and we can fire that out to Dale. Um, Dale, are you going to have another session sometime about, um, you know, establishing new perennial pastures, uh, that concept, is that going to be covered in any of these topics? Because you really just talked about, you know, utilizing existing. Um, yeah. Are you going to have anything on that down the road, do you know? Um, I mean, that that would certainly be something I'd be open to. Okay. If, if there's a demand for that, absolutely, I could do that. Because there, there is, you know, you talked about the, the low profitability in, in corn and beans, and especially on really marginal ground. Uh, and I don't know what you see from, you know, people that call in, but I'm seeing more and more people have an interest yes. in putting some of that back to some perennials. And, I uh, talked to a guy yesterday, he said, I've never owned a cow in my life, but I'm tired of growing corn for under $3 a bushel. Yeah. Yeah, there's there's uh, there's not a lot of profit in that. That's for sure. So no. Well, if if folks, if there's no questions, we sure appreciate everybody joining us. Um, you haven't missed much in the football game. The Chiefs are behind seven to zero. So I was wondering what, where the updates were. I guess you can <laughs> care to share that. <laughs> Chiefs had a touchdown called back. The guy dropped the ball in the end zone, but it was uh, it was good. Um, hey, Dale, we do have one question. Uh, Dave, yeah, asked, I see that. How would this relate to a mixed grass prairie further west? Same concepts, uh, all still apply. Uh, doesn't really change, all, although obviously your stocking rate, your productivity, your productivity is going to be less as you get into less and less rainfall. 
yeah. principles still apply. The, the intensity changes and you may have to get more rest period yeah. and things like that. Now, one thing, one thing that I, I might note, um, uh, I, I had a guy, I was listening to a presentation being given by somebody from Eastern Colorado once. And he was talking about his grazing system and a guy from, uh, I believe it was White Cloud, Kansas. If those of you that are familiar with White Cloud, that is the chunk of Iowa that got lost and ended up in Kansas. It's the absolute best soil in the state. I mean, you, you throw a corn seed out the window and, and 200 bushel corn magically springs up. It, it is the, the garden spot of Kansas soil. And it's in a fairly high rainfall area, it, it, by far the most productive part of Kansas. And this guy from White Cloud stood up and told the guy from Eastern Colorado that gets about 12 inches a year, said, you have it so easy where you are. <laughs> it's like, what? <laughs> Uh, said, you, I don't understand. You get three times my rainfall. He said, well, yeah, but you've got buffalo grass. That stuff's good every day of the year. You can even let it sit for a year and it's still good the next year. And if we don't graze our grass as it grows, it just turns into sawdust. And I thought, wow, that's, that's really correct. One thing you can do with those in those more arid areas is you can store grass out in the pasture. You can stockpile grass. Your warm season grasses stockpile very well and keep their quality and they really don't deteriorate because you don't get enough precipitation to deteriorate them. And so um, also uh, see another question, best time to try and establish alfalfa into native grass. Uh, I like I like fall better than spring um, because you've got a long time for that alfalfa to grow uh, unmolested without competition from the native grass. Um, now that kind of takes your burning management out of it a little bit. If you have legumes growing in uh, like alfalfa, uh, alfalfa actually responds very well to burning management, but that burning needs to be done in March rather than in April. It's a great way of taking out alfalfa weevil. But uh, yeah, I, I think we really overlook the potential of alfalfa as a rangeland legume. Been some good research done up in Montana, Wyoming, South Dakota, North Dakota on alfalfa as a rangeland legume, but not really down here. Uh, UNL has done some good research. Uh, first place I ever heard of it actually. And there's, there's some better alfalfas out there for range too. I'm kind of excited uh, that one of the seed companies that we work with is trying to breed a new type of falcata alfalfa, the old yes. yellow blossom, but they're trying to kind of bring that back to some newer genetics. And I think that's going to be a real good fit for what you're talking about. Yeah. Here. And, 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 and falcata's, uh, falcata alfalfa, one of the advantages is its longevity. I mean, a lot of times those plants will live 20, 30 years. Yeah. Opposed to our, uh, Metacago sativa alfalfas. Yeah. Well, folks, thanks again for joining us. Uh, enjoy your evening and uh, log back in next week. Uh, Dale, what's your topic next week? Um, I, you know, I should know that. <laughs> I should know that too, but I don't. I, I believe it is. Uh, I believe it is grazing cover crops. Oh, well, something. If you have any questions? Email Mary. She'll get you fixed up. If you don't have the uh, the links to get signed up. Uh, she'll take care of that as well. But uh, thanks for joining us and uh, we will see you next week. Okay. Thank you. Thank you.